Welcome to Scribbler Describe. I'm your host, David Scribbler Wishart, and I'm joined by my co-host, resident scribe, Pastor Ronnie Smith from Peace Lutheran Church. We invite you on a spiritual journey to explore questions of faith and the human experience. If you're searching for more meaning in your life, you're not alone. So join us as we search for wisdom and personal growth through a theological lens. All right, here we go. Okay. Welcome to Scribbler Describe. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, good to see you again, Ronnie. So, um, you too, thanks. I've had an interesting week. I don't know how yours has been. Uh, hopefully, productive. Yeah. But um, I've had one of those weeks where you learn a lot and where things weren't so good for parts of it and you're like, ah, oh, crap. Like just kind of in the thick of some crappy situations that at the time you're like, oh, what have I done? And made some mistakes and let situations kind of spiral into something that they didn't need to. Um, either because I, uh, didn't trust my instincts or I let fear decisions made based on fear dictate my actions. But one of the good things about bad situations that happen is that there are opportunities to grow and learn as long as you're open and willing to do that. So the question I really want to pose to you, um, you know, when we think about, Jesus is, was he ever afraid? Did he ever feel like fear was something that affected him? Did it affect his decisions? Is there any evidence of that that we see in the Bible of, of where um, he felt anxious or despairing about a situation? Or did he have, was faith always there for him? And so it just guided him through all those situations. Yeah, so in the past, we've been talking about, um, you know, the fully human Jesus. And if he's fully human, then yeah, he must have experienced fear and anxiety and these types of things. And there is some evidence in scripture to support that too. Um, in the garden, you know, he's sort of wrestling with God, like, do I really have to go through this kind of thing? Um, and then again, on the cross in one of the gospels, it's reported to have said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And these are pretty um, very powerful moments in, in Jesus' story um, that absolutely he was struggling to um, reconcile everything that was about to go down. So what, you know, so when we have when we feel fear and it, it starts to cloud our decision making, you know, what, what was Jesus doing to overcome that? How did he overcome his um, fear or trepidation about what was to come for him? Well, you mentioned his faith earlier, and of course, that's what carries him through. Ultimately, he knows all of these things, but just, you know, we've all, we've all have, would have a moment of weakness um ultimately you know faith in his in as we've said that the good news is god has come near um he knows very intimately what what god is all about and so he overcomes his fear essentially but there are those moments of doubt there are those moments of trepidation um you know he's not entirely sure he wants to go through with what's about to go down but you know, he composes himself eventually and, and things unfold as they do. Um, it's very gritty stuff though, you know, it's not, um, it's not really easy to dig into those matters. I mean, if that was us, if we were there, how many times would we stumble on that path? Um, but again, Jesus is not, um, 
you know, some people like to make him out to, the human Jesus out to be perfect, but just more evidence that he was more human than uh, maybe some people care to admit. Well, it feels like that line where he's on the cross and he says, God, why have you forsaken me? Is I think one of the most powerful lines because it seems to reveal that moment of weakness, you know, where it, it's all really has caught up to him. And, and maybe that's because that was sort of right at the end where he transitions from, you know, the, the physical uh, Jesus to, you know, the spiritual, you know, um, so maybe that's meaningful, right? Uh, letting go of kind of some of those earthly emotions. I, I'm not sure if that's what, why, or that's, that's what it means, but I've always found that to be just a very like powerful moment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the great strength in, in the greatest vulnerability, um, that whole dichotomy there, um, you know, you've thrown around a lot of words like, you know, forsaken, weakness, um, you know, obviously we're t talking about matters of crucifixion here, suffering. Um, these are all very human things that Jesus goes through. And we go through them too, and we find strength in Jesus's example. And, you know, ultimately God overcomes death in miraculous ways that are beyond our comprehension. Um, but there's tremendous power in these moments, in, these, in this gospel, in this ministry. And uh, a lot of it defies explanation. Yeah. So, you know, I think for, for Jesus, like he has, he's contemplating in the future, like his own death. And for some of us, it's not something quite so stark and severe, but if we think about death more metaphorically, like is this anxiety or fear that we're afraid of letting go of something like the death of some part of us that could happen like an existential dread or something of, of what's to come. And, and what is, what does the Bible have to say about that? Like of letting go of things that we're maybe clutching tightly to our chest that aren't actually helping us. I think ultimately what we're talking about here is transcendence. Um, you know, you're talking about contemplating our own death, stark, severe, existential dread, very heavy words, concepts, <clears throat> um, Jesus lives um, knowing that I guess our spiritual being is over our physical being somehow uh, and, uh, and only he you know fully knows what that was like I guess we can only sort of speculate and look to, at the records that we do have but we also have our own experience and um, we've talked a lot about near-death experience here through Lent as well. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it's a topic that's growing more, um, getting more press, I guess, if you will. Um, but we've heard reports far and wide about what happens when people die and, and you know, people sensing spirit and, uh, you know, even just your basic concepts of heaven, you know, people have some, uh, you know, pop culture mixed with folklore, mixed with scripture, uh, sort of uh, mixed with superstition, um, sort of um, understanding and experiences. Um, but ultimately, you know, spirituality, religion uh, speaks very directly to this idea of transcendence. Um, Jesus did it and sort of tells us, you know, basically, you know, how, how he did it, essentially. And this gives us a great strength and courage to live our lives without that kind of fear, because we know that this, when this shell is expired, life endures for us somehow. And uh, that allows us to live out our lives in a confidence 
um, which is one of the great things that religion and spiritual spirituality provides for people. That was a pretty uh, tangential <laughs> answer, but one of the questions that you queued up is, and I'll I'll get, put some context around it, but is why do I feel like fear is running my life? And I think there's probably a lot of people who are in that boat where it seems like some kind of anxiety or fears are dictating so many of the decisions that they make. And it doesn't mean that we're always afraid or fearful in all aspects of our life, but in some, some aspect of our life, it, it's dictating, you know, how we make decisions. Um, you know, so, uh, you, you know, I, the other day, um, you know, with a lot of this stuff, um, what I've noticed about myself over the past week is that I've had anxiety about letting others control certain decisions. Um, and because I have, because it has something to do with my own uncertainty about a situation and my discomfort with it, try to control it all. And by controlling it all, I'm creating an environment where people think that I don't trust them. Mm -hmm. And it may be not so much that I don't trust them, but I trust myself more. Right. <laughs> and whatever the case may be, it creates this environment where people feel like micromanaged and, or they just feel like they have no voice or that I don't care what they think or whatever the case may be. But um, I just had it come up in a bunch of different spots throughout the week in different situations. And I was like, oh, I got to really take a step back here mm -hmm. and think about what the heck am I doing that um, just can't get comfortable with those, those situations. Uh, and you know, it manifested itself in a funny way. And it, it just kind of hit, dawned on me how it was happening. But I was playing a board game um, with my family, and, you know, like kind of like a strategy game. And my instinct was to tell my son, who's six and a half, you know, this, here's what you want to do, because this would be like the optimal strategy in this situation and and I, I just kept wanting to like tell him how to take his turn mm -hmm. and everything and i had to stop myself constantly to, to shut that instinct down because i started to realize that well who cares really like if he if he doesn't do it perfect it doesn't matter it's a board game we're doing it for fun right um but that there is some instinct in me to uh, what some people would think of as micromanaging that situation. I never thought it would be like micromanaging it. That's not how I was really thinking about it, but it's kind of what is, was going on. And so it, it took some work, but I just kind of shut my mouth through the game and just let it happen. And I think that probably makes it more fun for everybody. <laughs> um you know without me taking their turn for them so to speak but right um you know so i'm i'm curious to hear like what situations can you think of in the, the bible where there's a character or somebody who is just that epitome of like fear um driving all of their decisions uh before you Thank you for that, David. Before I get to the second part, uh, just talk about the situation here. Um, I, th I believe you said that, you know, this management role is new to you, right? Yep. Uh, I wanted to ask, is it one that you wanted or had it sort of thrust upon you? No, it's, it's one that I wanted. Okay. 
Um, so now there's a lot more pressure on you because you're higher up the chain, I guess. Mm -hmm. And you feel like um, you're, you're on the line here more, maybe more than you ever have. It's your neck on the line. And nice. so you're going to do everything to make sure that you don't get burned and the job's going to get done and you're going to meet your targets. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and it stems out of a desire to do a positive desire to want to do a good job and, you know, not let the team down and, and those kinds of things. But it's, I guess it sounds like you're taking it to such an extreme that choking the life out of the team somehow and um you know stakes are i don't know how high the stakes are at your place in this case but people really need room to sort of show what they can do i guess in life on some level well you, and know, at least you can at least explain your approach your leadership style like if you, you can say you're intentional about trying to address it this way i want you guys to take on more responsibility however you want to frame that um but this you also talked about control which is maybe something that uh, comes naturally to some people more than others are you sounds like maybe you're like that in other areas of life too you mentioned the board game um so <clears throat> Essentially, people in that situation, they're trying to avoid lack of control somehow. That's at all costs. And then everything else sort of becomes secondary to that instinct, as, as you said, you, which was a good word. And it's hard to sort of, uh, you know, every time you have an instinct to sort of meet it with rationality and those kinds of things. Um, but um, maybe you have to trust them yes but also trust that your skills then are able to sort of um strengthen their weaknesses and you know tweak what they do rather than uh you know try to run the whole show or whatever however yeah. it works out um you got to give them some room to fail i guess um give you a basketball analogy i guess so there's always um like young up and coming guys on the on the raptors and, and any basketball team. Um, but in order to get better, you have to play the game. And if, if you don't play, it's really tough to develop. Um, and um, good coaches, I guess, will give them room to make mistakes and not be um, sort of harping on every little thing. Um, and just accept the fact that there will be mistakes, but together, um, you know, ideally you can you can get around that better to make a mistake on the side of having a strong team rather than strong individual leading a ragtag group of <laughs> however you want to say it. Um, I'm rambling now a little bit here too, but that was, that was, there was a lot in there too, but um, <clears throat> how do you, how does a person who seeks control learn to give up some kind of, some measure of control? You don't have to give it all up, but share the burden i guess um so you need to build into your life practicing not control in whatever shape that comes and then it should translate over into the workforce but also don't forget they picked you for a reason so like you're good enough um <clears throat> that uh, you know well not every, like not every little mistake that you make is is going to be so terrible either it's one of these situations that I, you know, one of the reasons I bring up is because it kind of came up in home life and everything too. Right. You know, and so and you're able to recognize that too. Especially as you, navigate. Use word, you use the word notice in here somewhere too. Oh. Noticing it is is 90% of the battle. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think that's definitely true. And um yeah, and and I find in today's environment too, with like COVID-19 and everything there's sort of like a real heightened sensitivity i feel it um you know about trying to navigate a world where you need to worry about we well, don't need to but you're worrying about you know the virus itself 
you're worrying about social norms and how you navigate a world where people have different expectations about how you should behave. And then secondary effects of what kind of retribution you might get for not behaving in the way that somebody thought you should. And um, so you, it's very easy to retreat from the world in that environment, and especially when you don't have to go out into the world if you're working remotely from home and stuff. It, it's it's so easy to, to sort of let your fear say, you know what, we're not going to do that thing or this thing because we're not going to put ourselves at risk. But you are putting yourself at risk. You're, you're, you are creating another situation that's maybe not healthy because you can't be hermits inside 24 seven either. Um, and then I'm implying you go into like some kind of risky, you know, huge group setting or something like this. I'm just saying like, um, it's not great for everybody's mental health to just sit around hiding inside all the time either. And so, um, I think that we can, we can let fear have us make a decision that we think is safe and it actually could be very dangerous in some fashion. And very so much of life is about that. Yeah. We make every day. Yeah. And we're making risk decisions all the time and we don't really ne necessarily appreciate or perceive that we even are too. Uh, there's trade-offs that are happening constantly. Um, so yeah, I, I very em it's an e it's a very emotionally charged time to be sure for sure um and you made you mentioned you said the word decisions now a number of times and <clears throat> i think the way the world was people were getting asked to make more and more decisions all the time and i guess since for people who work at home now maybe that's even amplified because of covid um you know, when there's no separation between home and work, um, kind of tuned, you're kind of turned on 24 seven. Yeah. You're always available to work. You don't have that in the past, I guess, when you went home, you generally sort of stopped working for the most part. You know, obviously there's exceptions, but um, in, an, in an emotionally charged time such as this, I think that uh, practicing empathy um, is very important because um, that's what the time calls for, you know, right? Ever since COVID first, we went into lockdown. I could sense like I, there's a palpable sense that people were, fo were forced all of a sudden to care a lot more about one another than they pr had the day before. And that's only sort of um, grown, I guess, since in this past year. Um, and there's notable exceptions, of course, but by and large, people have been forced to care about the person next to them, the person on the street, person at the grocery store. We've all had to exercise this level of care that we weren't really accustomed to. And so if you care for your people, you know, and, and you're competent, and you're skilled and all that too, but if you care for your people, um, you're going to get the best out of them. We hope you found your time nourishing and life-giving. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. If you would like to hear more and support the podcast and Peace Lutheran Church, please consider donating at the link in the description. For DW, I'm Pastor Ronnie Smith. Peace be with you.